Hey everybody, in this vlog I want to cover a couple different things. First of all, let's talk about long-term implications or long-term issues you're going to have when you run a SaaS, Software as a Service. So I have StudioWeb.com, which is a software as a service. Basically, it's a website that schools use to help teach kids how to code. So I have schools all over the U.S., all over the world, really. And so yesterday I got a tech support request from a particular district that has many schools. And they were having trouble accessing Studio Web. The response time was really, really slow. And they said that they had checked logging into Google, checked logging into some other site, and it was very fast, but with Studio Web, it was super slow. So I assumed right off the bat, I said, it's got to be our servers, because we've had an influx of a lot of brand new schools this year. And the old Studio Web app is, uh, shall we say, it's seven year old. It's using old ORM technology. It's got a very inefficient database structure. The code base is just, you know, after seven years, many developers, uh, it was built on a need to nerd basis. It's a bit of a mess. So that's why rewriting Studio Web 4 from scratch is almost ready to go, in fact. And it's so much faster in so many respects. And I can get into the details about how we made it so much faster later on. Well, Better ORM, better database structure, clearer code. There you go. So anyway, so I assume right off the top of the head, or right off the top when I got the tech support, since they said they were able to access other sites, no problem, it's got to be our server. So I go check the server, and the CPU utilization was pretty high. It was around 45 50%, but not much higher. When you got 50% CPU utilization, yes, it's going to be a little bit slower. There's no question about that. But to a, to a screeching halt, mm, Anyway, so what I did is, because I'm on a virtual private server, I can click, 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 and within a few minutes, you can add as much RAM and CPU as you want. So I increased the CPU and the RAM capacity by 50%, and, uh, and I did a few other optimizations, uh, quick ones, in uh, the database to see if I could uh, solve the problem. Because basically, Studio Web 3 code base, being seven years old, it's basically end of life. It's kind of like when the Python guys basically stopped development of Python 2 and started Python 3 because there were some fundamental problems with Python 2, I imagine, that couldn't be really fixed. So I said, okay, we're just going to do it. We're going to build Python 3. And that's what we're doing with Studio Web 4. Studio Web 4 is a fundamental total rewrite, fundamental change in architectures and so forth from Studio Web 3 because Studio Web 3's code base is just, you know, too much legacy. At some point, you got to drop the code. You got to move on, and start over again, and take advantage of new technologies. And and also, when you understand exactly what you need in your app, it's uh, a lot easier to write clean code as opposed to when you're first developing the concept of your app, where you're not quite sure what the client will need, so the code could meander in all kinds of different directions. But here's the interesting thing. After I took responsibility for a slowness in the uh, Studio Web software, I went on TechCrunch and I found out that apparently one of the major service providers in the U.S. was having major disruptions. And as was indicated in the TechCrunch article, they were saying that you would go to some sites and it would load fast, no problem. But then you would go to like Facebook or something, they mentioned Facebook and other big sites, and it wouldn't load at all. You'd just get like a, a blank page server request. So. And they had a map, a heat map, if you will, over the U.S. showing the areas where the service outages, the service outages were concentrated. And as it turns out, one of the main areas is where my particular district was having problems. And here's the thing. I didn't have any other schools complaining about the system being slow. So I have a feeling it had much more to do, my slowness in the Studio Web app, app had a lot more to do with the uh, service pro provider having problems with their uh, connectivity. We shall see. Now, this is the next day, and they're on it right now, the schools are. And I'm, see, you know, I'm s waiting to see what the response is today from uh, the administrators and so forth. And that's the thing. When you're dealing with larger clients and you have responsibility with tons and tons of, of uh, people using your system, it's a lot more nerve-wracking when you're deploying, you know what I mean? Especially stuff where the data is critical and uptime is critical. 
Other types of businesses where you have a lot, it's not so critical, these things, you have a lot more leeway in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of whether the apps are down, whether apps are a little slow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that you can allow apps to be down, but there's different levels of pressure, right? There's different levels of pressure. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So let me close off this video by pointing out that I finalized the structure for my business course. I'm calling it the business battle plan. I did a vote. We got a, you know, whatever, 30, 40 votes. More than 60% voted for business battle plan. I think it's good because when you're in business, it is competition. It's like getting on the field and you're competing and you got to have that game plan, that battle plan to win in the space. But at the same time, uh, when you're in business, your job, whether you're providing a product or a service, is to basically partner with your clients to help them achieve whatever goals they want to achieve. So uh, when you're in business, it's not just about battling. It's not just about competition. It's also about creating relationships. And uh, long-term relationships are best, of course. And it's about co cooperating and being uh, em empathetic, if you will, to, uh, if that's the right word, to have empathy for your market, for your clients, so that uh, you can make their lives easier in whatever it is that you're trying to help them with. Anyway, I'll stop there. So this business course is, uh, barring any unforeseen events, I'm uh, shooting now, and I think it, you might see some stuff up at the end of the week, and the model is going to be, instead of a course that... Uh, you pay like you know 50 bucks or whatever is 100 bucks for to download it i decided to make it much more interesting for people it's going to be subscription based i believe and then every week i'll be uploading two new course uh, courses from or two new lessons from the course and also responding to user input and questions so it's going to be a virtual mentoring type of situation where you're going to have the core course, both in video and podcast format. So the videos will be embedded within the subscription area, but I'll also give you access to be able to download the audio files, the MP3 files for all the lessons that are released. And this will be an ongoing thing based on Q&A, based on the, the course structure. But I've mapped out the first 17 chapters of this course, and I think I'll be launching with maybe five or six chapters up and then releasing new chapters over a subsequent month or so. And it's going to be an inexpensive monthly subscription. I think it's going to be maybe $10. Basically, buy me a beer, maybe a couple of coffees uh, every month, and uh, you have access to all the material and new material on an ongoing basis. And it's going to be uh, entrepreneurial business mentoring private form. We're just working out some of the final details with my techs. And that's about it. All right. If you heard the drilling, my apologies. There's doing some construction, and I started recording this as they were starting to drill. So, all right. We'll talk soon. Ciao, ciao.